So let's open up in prayer. Uh, Father, we pray for your word to be delivered to us this morning with, with open ears. Lord, uh, direct us to your path of righteousness, to the path of life. Through Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So today's sermon title is called, I Told You So. And so uh, we could just spend 45 minutes telling you all about the times I told you so, but we won't because we only have 45 minutes. So we're getting into the, uh, like I said, I've said this since I think it's chapter like 22, about 23, is we're getting away in the book of Acts and the narrative through Acts of where we're seeing the life of the church. And so it's hard to glean about the life of the church when we're focusing on Paul's mission, on Paul's missionary journey, on his, uh, when he gets arrested, because we don't see the life of the church. All we see is Paul and and his persecutions and uh, him getting delivered over to various tribunals and given his testimony. And so we can't really look at the life of the church because we don't have that in the text, we could look at where he travels and we could connect it to epistles and then use it as an opportunity to just talk about that epistle opposed to Acts, but uh, I decided not to. And so we're looking more at the life of Paul and what he is kind of the prototype of, which is obviously he's a forerunner, uh, well not a forerunner, he's um, uh uh, maybe the most the most visible. He's written the most epistles. He's the the foremost apostle, um, and in that he's a church planner. He's a pastor. He's a he's a leader. He's an elder, uh, an evangelist, and and much more. And so we're what I'm trying to do is look at aspects of Paul's ministry and how we apply that to the pastorate or how we should see that in the life of the church. Um, and so. What I'm going to focus on is when uh, we'll kind of recapitulate the chapter here in a second by reading a few of the primary verses uh, and take when Paul essentially said, I told you so, and what we should do about that. And so if you look in Acts 27, we'll start in verse 9. It says, since much time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous because even the fast, or that's the day of atonement, was already over. And so Paul, this is a little more context. Paul is traveling to Rome. He appealed as a Roman citizen. He's getting sent to Caesar. Uh, he, they still don't have any real charges against him. And he just appeals to Caesar for the case. And so that's where they're headed. Uh, he's been in prison well over two years. Uh, now he needs to take a trip to, he's being escorted to Rome. Uh, it's been a while, much time had passed. Paul advises them, the ship captains, saying, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also our lives. But the centurion paid more attention to the pilot, I'm sorry, he was talking to the centurion, paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. That seems like a natural. Yeah, it was, it ended up being a mistake for the centurion uh, in in a way, but that would be a natural thing for me. This guy's a prisoner, uh, this this guy is not the ship captain. He does not do this for a living, and he perceives that we're going to lose a lot of cargo and lives. Okay, maybe he's trying to get out of going to Rome, right? Uh, the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and the owner of the ship than to what Paul said, and because the harbor was not suitable to spend the winter in, the majority decided to put out to sea from there on the chance that somehow they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete, Uh, facing both southwest and northwest, and spend the winter there. So they know it's going to be a dangerous journey. They know know there's an odds that this is not the greatest time to head out, but we can't spend the winter here, so we're going to take the chances. Jumping to verse 18. Since we were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo. Right, They're out to sea. Uh, They hit the storm. They can't find ground. Uh, They can't get to where they're going. And so they have to take extreme measures. They start throwing out the cargo to make the ship lighter. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, that's how stormy it was, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. And so it got so bad, they're like, there's no hope for us. We'll just die. Verse 21 
Since they'd been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and have not set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Yet I urge you, yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only the ship. And it goes on that Paul recounts that there was an angel of the Lord that was sent to him the, that previous night to tell him and give him wisdom on what to do. And so, uh, with kind of focusing on Paul saying, I told you so, uh, there are a few distinctions we'll make here in a minute um, on the context of what he's saying. But you either you have one of two options here. Either Paul was not being very gracious, he was not, as 1 Corinthians 13, 4 talks, 4 through 5 talks about, like, love does not envy, love does not boast, it's not arrogant, it's not rude, it doesn't insist on its own way, uh, it's not irritable, right? Either Paul was not being very loving, and he was insisting on his own way, and he was being haughty and boastful, uh, or... Or it was appropriate for him to say, you should have listened to me, right? And in the context, uh, it was definitely right. They should have listened to him. They wouldn't have been out to sea and thrown their cargo out if they did. Would have been a different situation. And so uh, to make a distinction, this isn't a church that he's pastoring. This is men on a ship, and he's the prisoner. Of the, and he's telling the centurion, and everyone. And but what we get into trouble, we get into trouble when we look at scripture and we say that uh, Paul was in the wrong. Paul was wrong here to say, you should have listened to me. I told you so. Because we generally come, I would, I would think uh, that we generally come to the table saying, if we tell somebody that we told them so, then it's wrong, that we shouldn't do that. It's improper. It's impolite. It doesn't make them feel good. I don't think Paul was really concerned about the feelings of the men on the ship at that point. They had given up all hope of being saved. Um, and so what we don't want to do is come to the scriptures and start judging the scriptures based on our own, our own ways. Right? We don't want to come and start judging Paul unless it directly tells us that, that somebody was in the wrong. And so... Uh, there, there are a few instances, one of them being when Paul came to Peter and said that he was in the wrong for not eating with the Gentiles. There was a clear example when Paul said, what Peter was doing was wrong, and I told him to his face, you could assume that what Peter was doing was wrong because the scripture tells us that, right? But we would have to decide on the other, we'd have to go to the other side, and unless the scriptures tell us that what the apostles were doing was wrong, or in poor taste, or whatever, then uh, we should assume that what they're doing is is right, and so, um, uh, so in this context, it was very appropriate for Paul to say, "I told you so. You should have listened to me." And a couple things I just want to bring out about that is that uh, there are appropriate times to do that. Right? I think this is a little bit of a more of an, an evangelistic opportunity. For Paul, this is an opportunity for him to say, uh, you should have, he could have just passed over and said, an angel of the Lord came to me last night and this is what we should do. And just skipped over the, I told you so, right? He could have done that. It was a fair opportunity. He didn't have to say that. Uh, Luke didn't even have to record that if he didn't want to, uh, but he did. And so what do we do with that? Uh, I think in this context, it's, it's an evangelistic opportunity. He's with men for an extended period of time in hardship. Uh, it doesn't give us much other um, information about the life of uh, what the life was like on the ship, whether Paul was like evangelizing to people or doing something, but we could just probably assume that he was. Uh, the centurion liked him. We find that out through the book of Acts that the centurion that was following him and escorting him gives him favor. Uh, later on in this chapter, it says that when they want to kill all the prisoners, uh, you know, when the, it seems like the ship is going to get wrecked, and the centurion is like, well, what do we do now? We can't let them escape. Well, let's just kill them. That's the next best option. Uh, we can't get them to Rome. We can't let them escape. Let's kill them. Uh, 
the centurion that's in charge says, let's not do that for the sake of Paul. He liked Paul enough that he wanted to keep him alive, that he cared for him. And so you could kind of assume that Paul was continuing his, his life's mission to evangelize, to preach the gospel, to proclaim Christ, to be a witness while he was in his chains on the ship. And there was some kind of uh, closer bond, at least some, he had some demeanor towards the centurion that he wanted to keep Paul alive. And, and so this is an evangelistic opportunity, but it's an evangelistic opportunity where he said, I told you so. I had the opportunity to gloss over this matter where I had more wisdom and insights and uh, you didn't take my counsel and I'm going to remind you that you should have taken my counsel because I think it comes more poignant when here's some more counsel you're going to need to take, right? And so even though this is an evangelistic opportunity where most of the people are not believers, um, obviously Luke is traveling with Paul. I'm not actually sure how many people were traveling with him. It could have just been Paul or Paul and Luke at this point. Um, I don't know if it would have been a small team or if everyone was kind of dispersed to do uh, their missionary work uh, elsewhere, but I'm, I'm just not sure. And, and so uh, this is an opportunity where he uses, here's the counsel I gave you. You should have listened to me. Here's more counsel, <laughs> right? And so I think we have opportunity uh, just in the life of the church to uh, use that example. And what Paul's doing here is to remind us of when we get counsel, uh, really, it really is, it's not Paul's decision whether they should stay in the harbor for winter or not. He's the prisoner. It wasn't, he wasn't in charge. He wasn't the pilot. He wasn't the owner of the ship. He was giving counsel. When we give counsel, uh, when uh, pastors give counsel, when friends give counsel, it's in a context where when other you know, believers in the body of the church give counsel, it's, in the, it's always in the context of unless I, can, unless I have some kind of right or authority over you to tell you you have to do this or there's going to be consequences that I'm going to institute, then it's just counsel. You take it or you leave it, and it's your life. <laughs> but again, the consequences are it's your life. It's your consequences. You get to choose. Um, now, I would be in a hard, I would, again, I'd be in a hard spot if I was the uh, centurion, like, do I listen to the prisoner or do I listen to the owner of the ship? Uh, I'm not sure I would have made any uh, different decision there, but I, but I would have been reminded that I, I should have. And so, um, and so what Paul's doing here is, is reminding them of the counsel he gave to give them more counsel. And I'm making that point over and over because I want to make it kind of clear that because we're sinful people, we have a tendency to do two things on the uh, person giving counsel and the person receiving counsel side. When we are the ones that received counsel, didn't do it in hindsight's 2020, and we see that, oh, this person was right, that was a wise decision, they saw something I didn't see, we have a tendency to uh, uh, back off and not press into more counsel right? Because we have pride. We're, we're selfish. We want to, uh, we want to have to say that, oh, Paul was right, right? I don't know how many of these people on the boat who were giving up hope and for all life were thinking or saying to Paul, Paul, we should have listened to you. <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't tell us. Uh, but I bet they, I bet the centurion was thinking it at some point. Um, and so we have a tendency when we receive counsel, when we don't take it, it really is our life, it's our decision, and then we have a tendency not to press in to further counsel of, oh, this was right. Why did they, what did they see that I didn't see? What did they, was it, uh, was it the Lord just giving wisdom? Was it life experience? Was it all of this stuff put together? Who knows, right? We have a tendency to, uh, back away instead of pressing forward. And then on the side of giving counsel, we have a tendency to back off saying, I told you so. We have a tendency to uh, not have the, when we have the opportunity that Paul had where we could give more counsel for, uh, 
for more wisdom to help out whatever that situation is, we have a tendency, because I think it's mostly, if I was just generally for everybody, it's, it's a false sense of pride. It's a timidity to not say, this is the counsel I gave you. You should have listened to this. Now let me give you some more, right? Or we jump over and we give them more counsel uh, without doing due diligence and say, well, remember when I told you about this six months ago and I told you this would happen and you didn't listen to me and now that happened? I need you to understand that so that you take this counsel, right? If uh, from the, the giving counsel, the pastorate side, it's very easy to go with, you got, you've always got two options when there's, there's sin or anything in play. You can either cover it in love and forget about it, or you can confront it. There's nothing else. There's no other options. And uh, you can't, you know, ruminate on it. You can't get bitter. You can't think about it that that person didn't take my counsel, and then I hope they take my next counsel and be bitter about that too. Uh, you can't do that either. You can either cover it in love and forget about it or, or confront it. And I think what Paul's doing here gives us an example of, of uh, what we could use in the life of the church is when you shouldn't look for the opportunities to be like, yeah, I can't wait to tell that person like in six months from now, I told you so. I can't wait to like really say like, ha ha, gotcha. <laughs> I knew it was going to happen, <laughs> right? We shouldn't be, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't have a haughty spirit. We shouldn't be prideful. We shouldn't hope for someone's demise. But I'm thinking of just, uh, not with anybody who's sitting here today or, or necessarily in our church, I'm thinking of a couple of situations in my life where I'm, just waiting for it to play out and waiting for that person to have a conversation and uh, so I can give more counsel because I hope the best for people's life, lives. And so uh, when you're giving counsel and when you're giving wisdom that's you know, sometimes clear in Scripture, when we're doing that in the life of the church and, and, there's, and someone comes to you and they're saying you know, they maybe had a decision about like, oh, you know, they should make this decision or that decision. It's not a big deal, but uh, it ends up turning out bad and you gave them counsel and then they come to you and six months later it turns out bad or something. And then you have the opportunity to say, hey, yeah, I understand it's, it's turned out bad. Uh, it wasn't the wisest decision. That the ball was in your court. Remember when I reminded you that this would probably happen? This is what I think you should do now. And I think that is much more effective and biblical than... Uh, just giving counsel without uh, thought of the past, if that makes sense. And so I think that becomes useful in the life of the church. And, and, but you should always uh, go to Galatians 6 where it says that whoever's spiritual should restore another in a, in a spirit um, of humbleness or a spirit of gentleness. And so if you can't do that, then you shouldn't do it, Right? You can't say, I told you so, without a spirit of gentleness. You can't do it without uh, a spirit of wanting the person to be restored. And so <clears throat> just keep that in your tool bag of, of uh, how to counsel, how to give counsel, how to give wisdom. And so um, in, this kinda, in this book or in this chapter of Acts, when we're following Paul, He's on his apostolic journey to plant churches, and we see a lot of the life of the church and what's going on, um, and we're at that point again where Paul is traveling to Rome because he's been arrested, and we don't see the life of the church. We don't see how uh, he's discipling or how he's interacting with a group of believers or how he's raising up leaders or, or how he's... Um, doing a lot of things because he's just a, a captive. And so I think it's a safe assumption in the book of Acts to follow Paul as a, uh, as a prototype. I shouldn't say prototype because he wasn't the first. There was the 12 other apostles that were um, sent after Christ and that were sent before Paul. Uh, but to hold... Paul to a type of prototype of, of this apostolic uh, mission and kind of the head of a church, the head of almost, I don't want to say just a, a, as a pastor, 
because he was much more than that, but we see that Paul's ministry stems from Jesus saying, I will build my church, right? It stems from Acts 1-8, you will receive power from on high, and you'll be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. And so if anything gets a little, like if anything, if I question God on anything, I'm like, so why are you then following one guy for half of the book? Why do we get just the insight into this one guy for a little more than half of this book? And so I think the safest assumption is that we're seeing, and why do we get 13 of Paul's letters, and why do we get most of the New Testament written by this one guy? Um, and obviously we have, out of the 27 books, you know, 13 were written by Paul. Um, and, but why do we get that? And I think the safest assumption is that his life and his ministry is, as, as an apostle is the foundations of what we should see in every church. Not that we should be looking for one single guy like Paul was to be doing all of these things. I think that's a special apostolic calling. <clears throat> but we have to view it in terms of Jesus saying, I will build my church. <coughs> Excuse me. And so there's a lot of things that we should be gleaning from Paul's ministry that we should take principles from, that we should use in the life of the church, um, that we should glean from the, in terms of principles, but not in method. And so that means that uh, Paul was a church planter, and so we should take that principle of every church should seek to be planting more churches. And that's the principle, but we don't have to do it in the same method. We don't have to travel by boat. It'd be really hard uh, unless you've got a trailer to travel down spinning and spalding by boat. Uh, you, you need something or a lot more rain, <clears throat> right? Paul was a church planner, so every, every church should be seeking, it should be part of the mission to plant more churches, right? Paul argued publicly, um, and that's the, that's the principle. Paul argued and, and had a public witness, Right? But we don't have to uh, go to the synagogues. Right? The principle is that a church should seek to have a public apologetics ministry where uh, either we're sending people out or there's people who, who could do public debates or, or something. But we don't have to do it in the same method. We don't have to go to the synagogue. Right? Right? Those other, other methods of doing it. <clears throat> Paul wrote literature to the churches. Uh, but we don't have to write it on papyrus, right? The principle is what we see in Paul is God is using him to build his church. He is planning churches. There's obviously in Acts, Acts 1, we see that there's supposed to be a public witness, right? Uh, go through, not just with Paul, um, sorry, who was in Acts 6? Uh, Stephen had that public witness, but maybe it's... Who goes to Samaria? Uh, Philip. Philip. Philip the evangelist, right. Acts 8, thank you. Right, there was, a, there was a deliverance ministry. There was a public ministry where he's going out, uh, evangelizing. That should be... We should take those principles of what all these people are doing as principles for every church, right? We should have a... Uh, we should have evangelism. We should have public evangelism. Uh, like I said, Paul wrote literature to other churches. Paul wrote, and most of that was uh, for the upbuilding of them. Do this, don't do that, right? Do this, focus on this. And so every church should be seeking to write some type of literature, right? We should um, be, our, our pastors should be writing, I think, literature inside our own church, to be like, here's an issue. We, most, most of us would just call those white papers. Here's our position on this. And a lot of those are theological topics um, that you can see. And I don't want to downgrade the epistles and then say that those were just white papers for those churches because that's obviously not true. But Paul handles a lot of theological issues up front. Here's what we have, right? Uh, and then here's how to live. And so it would be helpful um, if, if we kept that at the forefront of our mind uh, for when we do that to, to receive it. This is how we should operate. This is what we should do. This is what we believe. 
right? Um, and so when we go through the book of Acts and we start focusing on, on Paul, what we want to do is glean the principles and keep in mind that Jesus says, I am building my church. This is how he's doing it. Um, and, and so in, in this chapter in particular, when, when Paul is, is evangelizing, he's giving opportunity for counsel. Obviously, he has a divine intervention. Uh, an angel comes to him and tells him, this is what you should do, right? Uh, they have opportunity to listen to him. And they could be like, no, you're crazy. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to listen to you, Right? But uh, for whatever reason, God chose Paul as kind of a, a forerunner to, uh, for the book of Acts to show us how Christ is, is building his church. And so what we want to do is, is look at those principles and then say, what are the principles and how can we institute them in, in our church? What are, like what we've kind of said through the book of Acts, you should be reading it and say, why doesn't our church, why doesn't our life match what's going on in the book of Acts, right? We should look at that as, as, uh, uh, as the way Jesus is, is going to build his church, as the way that we're going to be witnesses to Christ. And so um, that's how we should be viewing the book of Acts, and then we have to look at that and say, why aren't we? Why doesn't our church live that way? What is? What are the uh, foundations that we're missing? What are? What are the pieces that we're missing? Right? What is? And then we have to say, like, what's the next step? And so, um, we're probably done a little bit early. I don't have. I can talk a little bit more about some of those principles if anybody has any questions, but. Uh, that's really what I want to get across is is looking at those principles and saying that that's what we should be instituting in our church. This is how we should live. This is how a church operates. Do we have any comments or questions? Daniel. Um, well, if you look at, yeah, is it is it is that principle for the church or is that principle for Paul? Uh, go to First Timothy one. And I think it's probably verse starting at verse twelve. Yeah, we'll start at twelve and go through like sixteen. I think him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost... Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. And so here, if it's not clear in other scriptures, Paul says that he is an example of a sinner who's been saved by grace, right? He is, and that, so that goes for everybody. If you follow Paul, there is at least something in his life that uh, points to that you should be an example so I don't believe uh, in that Paul's life is prototypical of every believer in every way, right? 
he had a he was an apostle, so you could look at distinctions and say, is every person called to be a church planter, the head of a church plant? No. I think that's pretty clear. Well, I'm is say maybe Right. Is everyone Right, because you have to say that if if there's going to, you know, because we don't, God doesn't distribute gifts to everybody equally. <gasps> I don't know. <laughs> He's an unfair father. <laughs> if you thought that, you're wrong. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, so God distributes gifts, and part of those gifts are, are service ministries as he sees fit. But then at the same time, that gift is not detached from the body. Is that where the breakdown is? Is it that it's something where Paul's operating in a specific gift and that's not for everybody? Yeah, he's operating in general. Right. He has a specific gift and his ministry is specifically for him, but he couldn't do that without everybody else on board. Right. right? Yeah, and every church does need every gift. If, if using the body analogy, if a if a church doesn't have you know in the body of, in this body of Christ, if we're missing our right hand, that makes our left hand work a lot harder, and we can only carry. <laughs> right. Right, and so uh, in those ministries, in the general ministry, the church is called uh, to to be church planters in the models that the apostles, uh, you know, that we see in Scripture, the models we see in Scripture, but everyone should be partaking in some way, whether that's just simple prayer, whether that's through tithing faithfully, whether that's uh, 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 going on a church planning team, whether, uh, you know, that's uh, taking over, you know, so someone else could do something else. It's filling in gaps, you know, it's, it's in the life and the body of the church. You just, for everything to work smoothly, everybody has to be on board. And you really need, and it doesn't matter if that's five people or it doesn't matter if that's 2,000 people, right? It's, it, it doesn't go the way God designed it unless everybody's partaking, right? Because then you have a, a lame body of the, of the church that's not operating. And so... The, what we see in Paul, I would say it's directly related, even though we're looking at one specific man for the most of Acts, it's how Christ is building his church. So he does have specific gifts and calling, but I think that's what the apostle was. If you, if you look at the fivefold ministries in, in the book of Ephesians, apostles, prophets, shepherds, teachers, evangelists, and if you had helps and administrations, Paul kind of fit the bill for all of that <laughs> in a lot of ways. Uh, that doesn't mean, you know, he brought on, who was the guy? It wasn't Timothy. It was the other guy he brought that was uh, previously prophesying a lot, right? So it doesn't say that Paul was the head prophet, but he did bring other prophets in his main team that were, that were prophesying a lot. <clears throat> and so what you want to look in the life of Paul as a, as a model is, is more in general, not in... Uh, Paul did this, so I needed to do this, right? He argued publicly. That's not for everybody, <laughs> right? He wrote. Uh, that's not for everybody. Uh, everybody could do it, but not everyone's called to do it. But in the life of the church, everyone's called to participate. Everyone's called to work together. Everyone's called to use their giftings as God has called them in the life of the church to be a be a public witness of Jesus Christ to and to... See Christ's church built. What you can't do is not do anything. That's the only thing you can't do is nothing. Right? Anybody else have any questions or, or comments? Go ahead, John Luke.
good is what Paul tells them not to, or everyone's life is at stake. So it's like that's the gifts that man holds, but everyone needs to be on board, like you said, in order to prosper and work to grow. Right? Is that like an example? Sure, you could say that because I believe that God is ultimately sovereign, and the scriptures clearly point to that, and everything is a gift. So even unbelievers uh, get certain gifts from men because it's not from them, <laughs> right? It's not, they didn't choose to get born. They didn't choose to do a lot of things. <clears throat> and uh, uh, they do choose to do some things. Uh, but, right, yeah, so God distributes gifts, uh, I think, worldwide. But mostly what we see in Scripture is he's giving gifts to men in the church to be witnesses of Christ, to build the church, to expand the kingdom of God, mm-hmm. right? I don't know, I don't really see anywhere in scripture where it talks about the gifts he's distributing to, to unbelievers. But uh, logically that follows. Yeah, and so what we're called to do is be a church that, that prays, that, that asks God, where's, where's our gifting and how do we use that in being a witness to Christ? How do we use that in building up the body of Christ? Right, how do we, that's our, you know, that's the main, the main ministries of collectively a body is to be a witness of Christ and to build up the body of Christ. And so how do we use our giftingness towards that, right? Not, you can ask, how do I use my giftingness to get a better job? How do I use my giftingness to uh, do a lot of things? Um, but really seek and ask the Lord, how do I use my giftingness to be a witness to Christ? And how do I use it to build up the church? Mm-hmm. Any other questions or comments? All right, well, with that, I'll close in prayer. We've got a little bit extra time to grab coffee and, and be ready for worship. Lord, thank you uh, for your word this morning. Thank you that you deliver us your spirit freely. Give us, uh, make us excited about worship, about worshiping you here together uh, with one another on your day. In Jesus Christ we pray, amen.